celebrate today. Happy Father's Day. Yeah, I, I woke up this morning. My Father's Day gift was that two of the three of my kids are sick. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. But I'm here with you guys, so you guys pray for my wife who's at home with both of those, with both of those kids. So, uh, you know, I heard something. We've been talking about the, the stormers. You know, I had to, us not having DSTV at home and, and still trying to learn a little bit about rugby here, I had to say, okay, what's up with the Stormers? What happened yesterday? Because, again, I'm a dad of three kids and two of them are sick, so I don't have a clue what's been going on outside of the walls of our house. And then I heard that the Stormers had this amazing win and, and you know, you guys have got a flag on the st- I know, it's, yeah, people are so excited. And then I heard that, that Smiley, who leads our worship team, said, no, I was the only Bulls fan. It was the Bulls, right? Was the only Bulls fan that was, in the, that was in the stadium. I thought, this plays in so, so well because the, the first thing that we're talking about is, is we're talking about like taking risk and being risk takers. And so the question I have for you is, are you a risk taker? So obviously Smiley was a risk taker yesterday by being the only Bulls fan in the stadium, but there's other versions of being a risk taker. So many of you know people that are like this. These are people that go to the mall at the end of the month. These are people that are not afraid to stand in line at clicks. These are people that are bold enough to have more than three kids. These are... You know, all of our risk takers, these are the, the, the people that are willing to jump off a bridge into the water. These are the people that are willing to go skydiving and, and uh, you know, jump out of airplanes and all kinds of different things. So you, you know the risk takers. And you know, if you're a risk taker, uh, then, hey, if you're in cryptocurrency, yeah, sorry, I know that's struggling a bit right now. But, hey, you took a risk on that. So you, you, you can call yourself a risk taker. So that's a lot of us. A lot of us are in that category, but then there's another category, and I've named this other category, are you a a play it safer? So this is somebody that's a bit more calculated, somebody that that doesn't want to be pushed outside of their comfort zone, somebody that says, hey, let me weigh this thing out. Let me me weigh out the benefit or the reward or the possible risk, you know, And, and hey, as a play it safer, you can still jump off a bridge into the water below, but you're just pausing for that second to wonder, is the water deep enough? And while you're thinking about these things, the risk taker has already jumped and they're feet first into the water. But we, we have these play it safer people that are just like, you know what, I, I just want to make sure everything's within my, within my means and within my capability. Now, all of us are maybe not risk takers or play it safers. We all sort of kind of find ourselves somewhere on the spectrum. You know, when I was much younger, I was more of a risk taker. And as I'm getting older, I find myself as more of a play it safer because I I think, you know, uh, my body hurts a bit more. You know, I enjoy a nap, uh, all of those things. And so as we get old, we, all, we often go to the play at safer side. Unless you have a midlife crisis, then you decide at 40 to become more of a risk taker. But find yourself somewhere on that spectrum. Kind of think about your life and think, okay, where am I between a risk taker and a play at safer? Where do I find myself kind of on that spectrum? And I want you to think about this. So no matter where you find yourself on the spectrum, no matter where, every decision that you make has some kind of motivating factor behind it. So the difference is, is as a risk taker, it doesn't take a lot to motivate you to make a decision. You see bridge, you see water, you see fun, you jump. Whereas a play it safer, they see bridge, they see water, they think, is this going to be fun? Is this going to feel fun? Is it going to feel fun tomorrow? And so you have a decision process that you have to make. So what exactly is that decision process? The process that we all go through when we make a decision and when we're measuring up risk is is on the other side of every risk, there's a reward. So on the other side of every risk, there is a reward. And Josh, put that slide up here for us, please. The potential for the reward is what makes the risk worth it. So think about that. So in all the decisions that you make, regardless of what they are, so you've got three kids and one of your, your spouse wants to have a fourth, you may think to yourself, is it, is it going to be worth it? What, what, on the, what is the reward to this? And for a lot of people, it's an amazing reward. You get to bring another person into the world. You love being a parent. And so you say, absolutely, I'm going to take this, this risk here. But it, it's important for you to understand that all of you make this decision. All of you. 
All of you run all of your decisions through this filter. On the other side of every risk, whether it be small, big, regardless of what it is, there's some kind of reward, and you're deciding, is the reward going to be worth it? And if it is, then it's worth taking the risk. And if it's not, then it's not worth taking the risk. This is just basic human decision-making. This is just this is about as basic as it gets. And so let's look at some areas where, where you make these decisions. These are things that we all look at. So money, you have your relationships, you have your career, you have social settings, you've got self-worth, you've got community. So th- these are areas where, where you, you look at these areas in your life. And I just picked out a few. There's a lot of different areas in your life that this right here applies to. But when you look at your finances, you think, okay, before I buy this new car... You measure the risk. Is it going to be worth it? Is it not going to be worth it? Is the reward of driving a new car going to motivate me to do this? When you look at relationships, your career, social settings, and by social settings, this is something I really identify with as an extreme introvert. I think, okay, if I go out in this social setting, the risk may be that it puts me out of my comfort zone. I have to be a bit more extroverted. So is this going to be worth it? Is the reward going to be worth it? We actually had... My family had this exact thing happen on Friday night. So on Friday night, we were invited to a bri with some friends. And it was one of those typical things where, you know, everyone in our house is healthy. Everyone is fine. We get invited to this bri. These friends of ours have invited two other families because they want to connect us all. I mean, it's wonderful. We're so excited to go. And then one of our kids gets sick. And so we're like, okay, that's fine. We get a babysitter. Babysitter's going to come. And then that kid, we, it's Benjamin, the guy we call Jam. And Jam gets sick. And Jam decides that he doesn't want mom to leave. He says, I do not want mom to leave tonight. And so Casey and I come up with this crazy plan where we're going to lie to our kid. And so I go at 6 o'clock, I go to the bri. Or I'm supposed to go to the bri. And then Casey is going to stay home. And she's going to put Benjamin to bed. And the babysitter is still coming. The babysitter came, but to Benjamin, the babysitter was coming to stay with baby Wyatt. So we have now spun this incredibly complicated web of deceit. All right, And I, I looked at Casey. So then Casey's like, okay, I'm going to put Jam to bed. Then I'll come to the bride and I'll bring the baby. And the babysitter will be at home. Everything will be safe and fine. And I'm like, is this worth it? Like, why don't we just cancel, stay home, you know, let's, let's not do this, let's not push the situation. And Casey says, no, 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 the reward in this social setting, the reward to the relationship making, the reward to the community is so worth it because there's three amazing families that we get to become friends with and love on and they're good Christian families and this could be absolutely worth it. And you know what? It was. And fortunately, Benjamin did not wake up. So when he woke up in the morning, he had no clue that mom was gone. He had no clue that a babysitter was there. And so it worked out. But we had to make this this assessment of, is it worth it? Now, you guys, when you look at this list and you look at other areas in your life, you can say, okay, I can be a risk taker in money and in my career, but I'm not so sure about my self-worth or about community. Maybe I'm not a risk taker there. And we all have these things in our life, whether you're a risk taker or play it safer, and it's what I call a safety zone. And so when you look at your safety zones here, and Josh, thank you, sir. When you look at your safety zones here, you've got a lot of people will say, okay, I'm, I'm, I can be bold with my money, but you know what? Relationships, that's going to be a safety zone for me because I took a risk on relationships at one point in my life and I got hurt by that and I got burned by that. And you know what? I'm going to portion that to the side and make that a safety zone and I'm not going to take a risk there. Or you may look at your self-worth and say, you know what, I believed in myself. I put myself out there with a new community to try and build relationships. And I got made fun of or I got bullied or I wasn't accepted. And so I'm going to take my self-worth and I'm going to make that a safety zone. So I'm not going to believe in myself. Because if I believe in myself, then there's room for me to be let down. There's room for me to be upset or disappointed in myself. Maybe your safety zone is your career. You know, you've been in a career for a long time, but for whatever reason, you're afraid to try and advance yourself or you're afraid to take that step of faith out into a new career that you would enjoy so much more. But we, we all have no risk taker, no play it safer 
is free from a safety zone. We all have safety zones. All of us do. And, and I hope that as I'm talking about this, some of your safety zones come to mind where you think, you know what, there are these areas where I, I, these are no-go zones. I'm not touching these parts of my life. I'm not getting hurt in these parts of my life. I'm not pushing myself in these parts of my life. I'm going to make sure that these stay completely, completely safe and I can't get hurt in any way. And when we believe that way, we're up against something. And this is, this is a big reason why I wanted to speak on this. And we're going to be speaking on this for the next three weeks after today because we've been held captive. We've been held prisoners by this, this huge lie. And there's this lie that we've convinced ourselves is true. And this lie, it holds us back. And this lie that, that we've accepted for our own lives, it keeps you from being the fullness of who you are. I mean, I, I love when, when we go to the Karoo, and we go camping there. I love laying there at night where there's zero light pollution and looking up at the stars. And you just see all these amazing stars. I mean, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. And it's been so bright out there that you could play cards by starlight or by moonlight because it's just so bright and so wonderful. And I think, man, the same God that put those stars in the sky that created that beautiful evening that knit the universe together... That, that popped Table Mountain up out of the earth, that built this amazing city surrounded by this beautiful ocean, that same God is the God that made you. And when God made you, are you not much more important and valuable than a mountain or than an ocean or than stars in the sky? You are. You absolutely are. And when God made you, because you're so valuable and you're so important, He made a plan for your life. He created you as something unique in yourself that would allow you to walk into a plan and walk into a purpose that would be something that no one else could walk in. There's something so unique and so special about you. But because of this lie that we've prescribed to and we've decided to believe because we have these safety zones in our life, we don't walk in the fullness of what our life could actually be. Now this lie is this. It's this. If we risk nothing, then we can lose nothing. So we think that this makes us safe. You know what? If I don't risk anything then there's nothing that I can lose. If I just don't risk anything relationally, then I can't be hurt relationally. If I don't risk anything with my career, then I can't be let down because someone else got the promotion. If I don't risk anything with my self-worth, then I can't be let down and I can't get more depressed because somebody else did not accept me or I didn't believe in myself. If we don't get out of our safety zone, and, and we prescribe to this lie, if we risk nothing, then we can lose nothing. This is not the plan for your life. And where you are applying this to your life is where I hope over the next couple weeks that you put a stop to it. And you put an end to it. And you say, I'm no longer going to believe this for my life. Because I'm no longer going to accept that this is true in my life. I'm no longer going to play it safe. I'm no longer going to let fear determine and dictate what it is that I do with the uniqueness that God gave me and that God made in me. I, I remember, before we go on to, to what we're going to look at in the scripture, I remember I was, I was working in the construction industry. And I remember growing up and, and just my parents always asking me, what do you want to do for a living? What kind of person do you want to be? And I remember saying, well, I want to go and build the church. And people would say, oh, you want to be a carpenter or, or be a, you know, a construction worker? And I would say, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to build the people in the church. And my parents would always say, well, that's great, but you need to go find some way to get a job and get a job, and you can do that on the side. And so I did. I went to university, and I graduated, and then I was working in a, in a construction industry and doing very well there. And while I was there, I was like, man, there's still this emptiness in me. I still feel like my absolute calling is to go and build the church. And I remember talking with a, a, a pastor, a friend of mine, and saying, I'm just waiting on God to call me into missions. Because I so desperately want that. I feel like I was created to do that. And he looked at me and he said, Chris, no one else is created like you are. No one, it's not like there's a long line of people that are walking around saying, I want to go into missions and I want to move to a foreign country and I want to do all these extremely unique things. He said, you don't have to wait on a calling because when God made you, the purpose that he made for you, that is your calling. So if you're out there waiting on a calling, that calling's probably already there. But maybe because of this lie or maybe because of your safety zones, 
you, you haven't heard it or you're waiting for more proof to, to accept it and to adopt it into your life. And I, I really hope we can push past that. You know, praise the Lord, I, I, I will never forget the day that I just accepted, okay, you know what, I am called to do this. And I started the process of it, and it, it was just, it's led me here. And because of that, I'm married to a wonderful woman, I've got three amazing kids, and then I have, I mean, Sunday is my favorite day because I have this, this huge family that is South Point Church. I mean, my life couldn't be any better. And so what I hope to do is inspire you to look for the same thing in your life. So we're going to look at a scripture today, and this scripture we're going to find in Matthew. If you have a Bible, you can turn to it. If not, then you can follow us here on the screen, but it's Matthew chapter 25. And in Matthew chapter 25, where we find ourselves is Jesus is talking to the people. It's a week before he dies. So one week before Jesus is crucified, he's got a crowd of people around him, and he's teaching them. And what he's teaching them on is he's teaching them on the economy of the kingdom, like kingdom-minded economy. Basically what that means is Jesus is telling people, this is what is worth something and this is what is not worth something. This is what matters in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. This is what doesn't matter to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And so he's going through this process of teaching them. And he's telling these things called parables. And parables are, are these things that Jesus would tell in order to illustrate a point or to tell a story. And Jesus was an amazing teacher and he told these parables in a way, and this is where we we have to kind of be careful because these parables were told so that people could understand the concept, the, the context of it. So Jesus is speaking to a specific group of people and he's telling a parable, a story to them so that they understand a concept in a very specific way that will relate to them. And so we find ourselves in verse 14. It starts with again. The reason it starts with again, I want you to understand why the Bible is the way it is, is because Jesus has already been teaching them. So this tells me this is an important point. Jesus wants us to get this. He wants the people he's teaching to get this. Because he said, I've told you, I've told you. Now again, let me explain it to you again. So understand this. So he begins his parable, his story. He says, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So immediately, this is a familiar thing. So a a rich man, a landowner, a business owner, kind of the man of the house goes on a journey. And while he's gone, it would be a normal thing for him to call his workers, his servants to him and say, guys, I'm going to put you in charge while I'm away. So immediately the crowd can identify with him. And then in the next verse, he goes on and he says, To the one, so now this is the man giving to his servants, giving to the people looking after his wealth. So to one servant, he gave five bags of gold, and to another, he gave two bags, and to another, he gave one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Now, each bag of gold that he's given, each bag of gold was worth 20 years of a day laborer's salary. So this is a significant amount of wealth. So the one that gets five, he gets five times 20. The one that gets two, two times 20. Even the one that only gets one bag of gold, that's not insignificant. That's definitely not an insignificant amount. It's still 20 years worth of somebody, a day laborer's salary. And then I love in the part where it says, that you can go back one slide, Josh, where it says that, that he gave to each according to his ability. So it's like this master is a wise master. He's a smart master. He, he knows his workers. He knows his servants. He knows what they're capable of. He knows what they're able to handle. He knows their limits. He knows, he knows where they're good and where they're not good. And so he says, because I know them so well, and I know what they're, what they're able to do and what they're capable to do, that's how he proportions the wealth. So this is a very smart business guy. So all the people that Jesus is talking to are like, hey, I'm there. I got it. I understand this business guy, and I understand how smart he is, and this makes sense. So now we go to verse 16, and he says, The man who had received five bags of gold, he went at once and put his money to work, and he gained five bags more. So he went and invested the money to gain more. So also the one with two bags of gold, he gained two more. So both these guys have doubled their profits. And so then in verse 18, but the man who had received one bag, 
He went off, he dug a hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. Now, this may sound funny to you, or it may sound weird to you, but digging a hole in the ground and hiding your money, that was actually a pretty common thing. This was, they had some banking, but not a ton of banking, and not a good banking, like a secure system. It's not like uh, they don't have tapless, you know, contactless payments. They don't have chipped cards. They don't have cell phones where they have to approve or deny a purchase. And so what they would do, their version of that was dig a hole, put the money in it, cover the hole. There it is. Now it's protected. So, so even when Jesus says this, it makes sense. They understand this. So you've got two that invested and doubled their profits. And then you have the one guy here that says, okay, I was given one. I'm going to dig a hole and I'm going to put it in it. And so now in the next verse, in verse 19... So this has all happened. So after a long time, the master of the servants returned and settled accounts with them. So what it means by after a long time, have you ever, so because we have a three-year-old, have you ever, you know, uh, been in a situation with your kids or maybe you've seen this on TV or a movie or something where you tell your kids not to do something and then they don't do it, okay? But instead of leaving the room, you kind of like leave, but you, you keep looking and watching them. And, you know, maybe for the first 30 seconds, the kid doesn't do the thing you told him not to do. But once the kid realizes that, like, oh, mom and dad are, like, completely, like, gone, gone, all of a sudden their behavior changes and they do everything that you told them not to do. And so, like, Benjamin, another story about him. He's sick. Casey left. He was in the bath. Casey left quickly to go do something. I came in to take over bath time, and Benjamin had thrown water all over the floor because he'd been in there long enough. That's kind of what's happening here. The master has gone long enough that the charade and the act uh, has fallen. So when the master returns, he returns to what actually is there. It's not that these guys have kept up an act or kept up a charade. He returns to a group of people that had no idea when he was coming back. And he's been gone long enough that what he returns to is authentic and is true. So he returns to them. And then in verse 20, the man who had received five bags... Of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, You entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. And so then, next verse in 21, his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So, great job. He did well. Everyone understands that. So then, the guy with, with two bags comes to him in verse 22. And he comes and he says, Master, you entrusted me with the two bags of gold and see, I've gained two more. And so then in the next verse, the master replies, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. This is easy for me because I could just copy and paste from the previous verse and paste this verse here. And all I had to do is change this one number here. And and actually, I didn't even change the number there. But... That's to illustrate a point to you, on purpose, of course. That's to illustrate a point to you that the two, whether it was five bags or two bags, they got the same reward. It wasn't, you were, okay, the one that doubled five became ten got a bigger reward than the one that doubled two to four. No, they both got the same reward. They both got the exact same response. They both were invited into the master's happiness, meaning come and share in what makes me happy. Come and share in the household wealth. Come and share in this. So whether it was five or whether it was two, it doesn't matter to the master. The only thing he cares about is what happened with the wealth. He doesn't care how much wealth there is or how much wealth they return back to him. He just cares about what they did with it. And so based on that, now the third guy, poor third guy, he grabs a shovel. He goes out under the tree or wherever he's hid the gold. He digs it up. He probably washes it off, gives it a good polishing. And he comes to the master and he says, Master, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And then he goes on to say, So I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. So not only does this guy not do anything with what he's been entrusted to, He says, the reason I didn't invest the money is because you're a bad guy. So it's like him coming and saying, okay, I'm sorry. Obviously, I missed the assignment. 
I was supposed to go double this and come back with two bags of gold, but you're such a shrewd man. I mean, you harvest where you haven't planted seed. You go and you take, like you're a hard guy. You're kind of a mean guy, and I was afraid of you, so it's kind of your fault that I hid this gold in the ground, and then now here I am bringing it to you. So, sorry. Now, this is where... It's about, to get, it's about to get real up in here. I've got a graphical illustration of, of that for you here. It's about to get real. And it's about to get real because Jesus is about to say some really, really strong words. These words are, are, are extremely strong. Some of the strongest that I've heard Jesus say or that I've read that Jesus has said. That's why I think it's worth like, hey, let's pause Let's position our hearts, let's position our minds and our ears to receive what Jesus is, is about to say. Because it, it's kind of hard, and it's kind of harsh. And so Jesus, as he tells the story from the master's perspective, this is how he addresses the third man. And he says, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. I mean, t- to me, that feels harsh. This is what Jesus would say, the master would say. You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. You knew that. And then he goes on to say, well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. This is a a harsh statement. Jesus is calling this guy wicked, and lazy. Those are harsh words coming from Christ. And what I don't want us to do is I don't want us to extrapolate that out and think that, okay, if if I have a safety zone in my life, that means that I'm wicked and lazy. That's not what this means. That's not what this is about. Remember, Jesus is teaching a story to people. And oftentimes when we teach a story, we exaggerate a certain point to get a point across. You know, we, we, we want to make sure that something comes across in a very direct way. And what Jesus is trying to get to come across in a very direct way is that when you've been given something valuable, you've been given what they call talents, these, these bags of gold, what you do with it, what, how you value it and what you do with it and what you produce with it, 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 it that's where the value is. And so Jesus is, is saying those that do with what they've been given... Are blessed, and those that take what they've been given and dig a hole and bury it in it, well, those people are wicked and lazy. But that makes me think okay, why exactly are they wicked and lazy? Why would Jesus use such harsh words? And we're going to unpack that at the end here. But in, in the next verse, he goes on. And so, this is the master speaking to this poor old third guy, the third guy that did nothing while the master was gone for a long time. He dug a hole, put the gold in it, he walked away, and he went on with his life. And so he says, take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. So in this statement, whoever does not have, even what they have, that could be a bit confusing. Yeah, I, I know as I thought about it and prayed through this, I thought, man, this is kind of confusing. He doesn't have, but even what they have. And the way that I have interpreted this, and, and I think it's fair and safe to do this, but whoever does not have, it's like whoever doesn't have a desire for more, whoever doesn't have a desire to use their talents, whoever doesn't have a desire to invest uh, what, what they've been given in their life. You know, if you've been given a blessing in your life, you know, you turn around and you give that blessing to other people. You know, whoever doesn't have a desire to do more with their life or to do something with their life, whoever is, is, is not selfish. You know, it, it's basically saying that this guy here, he's lazy, he's selfish, he's self-centered. He doesn't think about anything else other than himself. He just wants to make sure that he's covered and that's it. And so this guy is missing some character. And so whoever does not have a certain amount or a certain kind of character or a certain appreciation for what someone has given him, even what they have will be taken from them. And then to finish this off just very harshly in verse 30, and he says, And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So if you're new to church and you're new to Christianity, I don't want you to be scared off. By, by this. 
No one is calling you wicked. Uh, If you've been here for 20 years, no one is calling you wicked. The purpose of this parable is not for you to walk out here and think, if I don't do something good with my day, then I'm a wicked person. That's not the purpose here. The purpose of Jesus teaching this parable is that this parable represents the danger of missed opportunity. See, this parable represents the danger of of not taking the opportunity of what you've been given and doing something with it for the benefit of yourself. You know, the reward for the two that invested the money was they got to participate in the master's kingdom. And so we have all this abundance of blessing in life that we can participate in. And I don't mean financial abundance of blessing. I mean joy. I mean hope. I mean laughter. I mean love. We have all this abundance that we can participate in. And so Jesus doesn't want us to miss opportunities where we've been given something. We've been given a talent, a valuable thing. That's the danger here. That's why Jesus uses such harsh language. And I'll take you back to to the the, the lie that we've prescribed and we've decided to believe. Danger, danger, okay? Danger, danger. If I risk nothing, I lose nothing. If I risk nothing, I lose nothing. See, that lie that we've prescribed to, it's if I take what's in my life, if I take my safety zone and I dig a hole and I put community there, or I put relationships there, or I put my finances there, or I I put whatever it is that you've decided is your safety zone. If you dig a hole and you put it in there and you leave it in there until years later you can unbury it and then turn around and use it, you think that I've risked nothing, therefore I lose nothing. But this isn't the case. This is a lie. So what do you get when you risk nothing to lose nothing? What actually do you get from this? And, and this, is, this is a hard word here. But what you get is you get regret. Now, regret is, is an incredibly um, kind of toxic emotion that we carry with us for a long, long time. And it often gets confused with another word that we don't like. And this word is, is failure. And so you have this idea of failure versus regret. Now, failure is not that bad. We should not be afraid of failure. We can fail forward. Because we fail means we're trying. Because we fail, it means we're putting effort into something. It's if, if we never did anything because we were worried about failure, we would never go to the moon. We would never invent things. We would never learn new skills. We would never, we would never progress as people or as a society or even as a culture. Failure is not a bad thing. You can fail forward and keep moving forward throughout your entire life. You learn from failure. Now, regret... This is something totally different. Regret is like a cancer. It's toxic. And it consumes you. And it stays with you. Until you process this regret. Until you let go of it and you work through it. It stays with you. And it taints you. And it just eats you from the inside out. And in fact, I I would say this to you. It's just a little bit of wisdom. Take it if you like it. Leave it if you don't. But your greatest regrets in life... Your greatest regrets in life will be the God-ordained risk that you don't take. The things that you're afraid to take will, will turn out to be your greatest regrets. In fact, I'll give you another piece of wisdom here. And it's this. You will not regret the mistakes you make nearly as much as the opportunities that you don't take. Think about that for your life. You will not regret the mistakes you make as much as the opportunities that you don't take. There is a great, wonderful life out there for you. There is. Remember, the God that hung the stars in the sky is the same God that created you with a purpose, that created you with a specific plan. It's that same God. And that same God has given you opportunities. And we we cannot go the rest of our lives being afraid of failure or being afraid to risk something. Because when we do, then we end up building regret on regret on regret. And we look back on our life. And those of us that are a bit older, you look back. It's easy to look back and say, man, when I was in high school, I wish I had done this, this, or this. Or when I was younger, I wish I had been, I wish that I had had hugged my kids more. Or I wish that I had jumped into community more. Or I wish that I had been easier to forgive somebody more. I wish that I would have received forgiveness from somebody 
that I chose not to receive forgiveness from. I wish, I wish, I wish. All these things are regrets. And at the end of your life, you're not going to sit there and think, man, I made all of these mistakes because we learn and we grow from our mistakes. But our regrets, the opportunities that we don't take, those we have to actually grieve. We have to grieve those missed opportunities. And so I, I want to leave you with a little bit of hope. And the hope that I would leave you is that your opportunities come disguised as insurmountable problems. Your opportunities come disguised as insurmountable problems. You show me a problem and I can help show you an opportunity. Casey and I, we adopted something a long, long, long time ago. And often we have to remind ourselves to apply this to our lives. But when life gets hard, when, when things go wrong, when we see insurmountable problems in front of us, then we tell ourselves, I am thankful that I have an extra opportunity to need God in my life. I'm thankful that I get to need God more desperately. I'm thankful that I get the opportunity to need God here. I'm thankful that God loves me enough and He's with me enough and I get to learn in a new way, in a hard way, that God is with me through what I feel like is an insurmountable problem. In every problem that you have, is a disguised opportunity. And if you look hard enough and you dig and you scratch around in it hard enough, you will find in every single problem that there is an opportunity there. There's an opportunity for you to lean into Jesus, lean into God, lean into community, get out of your safe zone. Let, let that lie of if I risk nothing, I lose nothing go. And decide that, you know what, this problem is no longer a problem. This is an opportunity. I, I tell my staff and I tell other people this, that a problem is a submarine with a hole in it. That's, that's, a, that's a big problem, right? A problem is a submarine with a hole in it. And that, that just helps put things into perspective of, you know what? We are not victims to our adversity. Our adversity then inspires us to be creative. Our adversity inspires creativity towards problem solving. Our adversity inspires opportunity. We're not victims to our problems. Let's stop being victims to our problems today. And so I, I'll, I'll say one more thing for you here. Until you're willing to risk something, you will continue to lose everything. So I want to tell you this here. We, we've got this, this life. So on one side, there's the life that you live. And on the other side, there's the life that you want. There's, this is the life that you have, and, and you may not be happy with it. It may have lots of safe zones. It may have lots of regret in there. It may have lots of things that need to be grieved. And it's easy to look over the fence and say, oh man, there's this life that I want, this, this bold life, this life of faith. I mean, I look at other people and they have all this joy. They have happiness. They're, they're willing to take risks. They're willing to, to live this, this life that I wish that I could live for me and my family. And the thing that sits in the middle of those two is some kind of risk. This is some decision that you make, some kind of risk that, that you have, where this risk is your opportunity to say, I'm no longer going to risk nothing in order to lose nothing. I'm no longer going to build regret on regret on regret. I'm no longer going to let my problems be insurmountable. Instead, I'm going to see my problems as opportunities. And these opportunities that I have with every risk is an opportunity for you to take a step towards the life that you want. Even if you fail forward, you can literally fail forward from the life you have to the life that you want. Failure is not something to be avoided. It's okay. And so today is, is sort of me unpacking this for you. And over the next three weeks, the reason I picked this series to, to tell you guys all of this, to, to talk about this, is because, guys, life is short. Life's very short. Some of us have people that were here, that, that were here a week ago and aren't here now. Some of us have people that, that we, we've seen the shortness and the frailty of life. And every single person out here was created with a unique purpose and a unique plan. 
Everybody has. You guys are so talented. You're so amazing. You're so wonderful. Even if you don't believe that for yourself, there's something in you that makes you so unique, that makes you you, that is so special that God took the time out of out of creating the universe to knit you together so perfectly and so wonderfully. Let's not take that beautiful thing that God created in you and and never, never take a risk. So we're going to pick up over the next three weeks and we're going to learn how to conquer this, this risk thing. We're going to learn how to go after and grab the life that we want and stop being victims to our problems. We're going to learn how to overcome our safety zones. We're going to learn how to grieve. We're going to learn how to work through these things. And at the end of the three weeks, you're going to walk out of here with more freedom than you thought you could ever have. So I'm going to pray for us. And and when I pray, the band's going to come up. And in this moment, this is a special moment that we kind of designed for you guys. And it's for you to just connect with God one more time. We want you to have an opportunity to connect with God before you walk through those doors. I mean, on the other side of those doors is an amazing Father's Day for many of you. It's a busy work day for some of you. It's distractions. It's to-do lists. It's everything. Life. As soon as you walk through those doors, you walk back into life. Well, right here, right now, we have paused your life. And you are just here. So take this two-minute opportunity to just connect with God one more time. And maybe that's you sitting and praying and asking God, okay, God, what's the safety zone of mine? How do I, how do I take opportunities to overcome my problems? How do I stop believing this lie of lose, of risk nothing, lose nothing? Or maybe you stand up and you raise your hands or you sing and you praise and you worship God. But whatever you need to do, this moment is here designed specifically for you. So let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you.